Okay, if you'll turn with me to 1 Peter as we pick up where we left off. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to pick up at verse 13. And we're going to read verse 13 through verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 21. And this is uh, the word of God. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Amen to that. The way that we think affects the way in which we behave. And I could quote a number of studies that point to that truth. I could tell a number of anecdotes that illustrate that truth. But I don't think I need to because I think it's self-evident, isn't it? We can look at our own lives or the lives of those whom we love. And we see how we often produce self-fulfilling prophecies in our own lives. You know, we find that we put our hands to something and we fail at it, not because we don't have the skills to accomplish it, but because we went into it believing that we were failures. There have been times in which we have succeeded against all odds at something that people said would be impossible. And it's not because we necessarily had the skills in that uh, case, but it's because we believed that we could do it, that we believed indeed we were winners. Now, Peter knows this is true as well, and as we begin his letter here, he has been reminding us of who we are. He's reminding us of our identities, and he began by telling us that we are exiles in this world. This world is not our home. We are but pilgrims, and we are longing for that which is truly home for us, and this is so important for us to understand and to grasp. Because it makes sense of the world around us. It makes sense as to why we feel so disconnected from what's going on around us so often. And why it is that the world is not quick to love God's people, but instead quick to judge and to mock and to rebuke. Peter is going to say that this should not surprise us at all. We are strangers here. As we go, he has been telling us that as exiles, we remember, we cast our eyes upon that which is our home as we, as we journey towards it. And as we go, as sufferings come our way, that we recognize that these sufferings produce fruit in our lives. What they do is they refine our faith, just like gold is refined in the fire and comes out more pure. So our faith is refined in times of trial and suffering S trials of various kinds peter says so this is true in persecution but it's also in time of struggles with health and struggles with finances and you can fill in the blanks whatever fits yours your situation god is at work in the midst of that whatever the trial is whatever the suffering is god is at work and he is refining your faith and so in times where we normally would be anxious, he teaches us, I'm faithful. And he burns off that anxiety so that the next time around you find yourself standing more firmly in your trust and faith in him. 
and times in which we thought that we had in ourselves the strength to face something. God will burn that off too. And he will bring us down to the point of crying out to him because we know we do not have what it takes. And we come out with a stronger faith, a more pure faith that Peter tells us we will be then able to offer unto Christ on the day in which we stand before him. And Christ will look at us and say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. And he reminds us that we can be confident this is all true because the prophets have been telling this to us. So we turned back into the pages of the Old Testament last week. We saw that the prophets said that there would be one who would come, the suffering servant of the Most High God, who would bear our stripes, our iniquities would be placed upon him, that he would indeed suffer, but he would end in glory. And Peter says, as it is true with him, so it shall be for you. So take hope because this is who you are. And so now here in this section, as he's finishing up his introduction of his letter, he continues this thought. And so verse 13 starts with, therefore, in other words, it's so in light of everything that I have been saying, these things are true as well. And he con continues with his consideration of our identities. Who are we in Christ? And how should our awareness of who we are affect the way in which we live? And so that's where we'll start. Who are you? Who are you in Christ? Well, Peter tells us a few things about us. Who are you? You are a child of the Father. Verse 14. Who are you? You are holy. Verses 15 and 16. Who are you? You are someone who is so valuable that you were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus, who has been since before the foundations of this world, but who came in the flesh in order that he might die for you. Verses 18 through 20. That is who you are. Now, does that affect the way in which you think? Does that affect the way in which you live? Well, Peter's going to say that it should. Out of an understanding of these things, you should, verse 13, prepare your minds for action. And being so reminded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's out of an understanding of these things that you should be obedient, verse 14. It's out of understanding of these things that you should indeed be holy in your conduct because you're called to be holy, verse 16. And finally, that it's out of understanding of these things that we should conduct ourselves in fear, verse 17. And so as a child of God who is, a, is holy and of great value to God, you should be obedient, holy, Conducting yourself in fear as you set your hope fully on the grace that will be revealed to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is what Peter has to say to us this morning. So let's walk through this. So verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded. Now, if you have an ESV, which I think many most of it doesn't I mean you can read whatever version you want but if you have an ESV I don't know if all of them have this but the ESV has a footnote on that verse right you see that after that phrase there there's a there's a one and you look down at the bottom of your page and you see that they explain that the Greek from which this is translated into English that's what it was originally written in it literally reads Girding up the loins of your mind. And they say that's what Peter actually wrote. That, that's, that, those are the words that Peter penned. 
Now, the ESV has chosen to try to make it easier for us to understand, as those who lived during this day and age rather than back then, they chose to try to make it easier for us to understand by translating it, prepare your minds for action, which is the right idea, but it loses some of the depth of the meaning. And that's kind of the problem with some of the um, way translations handle these things. And when you look at various translations, you notice that some translations say this and other translations say this. And depending on their methodology and what their goal is, they'll, they'll, they'll try to make it easier for us to understand. But again, sometimes we really lose a lot when that happens. So what does it mean, let's ask, to gird up the loins? Now, what this is referring to is that back in Peter's day, men would wear long tunics or long robes, basically, is what they are. Now, if someone is trying to try to run in such a thing, it can be a little bit difficult. I mean, I don't know. I've never worn what you women may be able to attest to that. That it's difficult to run in a a dress that goes down to your ankles. And so it would be for a man who's wearing a robe or a tunic. And this is especially troublesome if this one has been called to go into battle. That tunic or that robe could really be an impediment for success on the battlefield. So what would the soldiers do? Well, they would pull up the long train of those robes and they would pull it up between their legs and they take it and they tie off a big knot and they would, in essence, create from their robe a girdle around their waist to get the robe out of the way. They're removing the impediment to their having a successful battle by pulling up the robe. And that's why it's gird up your loins. You're creating a, a girdle, in essence, out of that robe. And so when he says... Girding up the loins of your mind, what does he mean? Well, the ESV translators say it means prepare your mind for action. Well, well, sure, but how? What Peter is getting at is that you prepare your mind for action by getting the things that would impede you out of the way. And what are the things in your mind that are impeding you? That's the question that he's dealing with. And that's why he calls them for sober judgment. Because a drunk man wearing a long robe is not going to make for a good soldier on the battlefield, right? So Peter says, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a battle ahead of you and you need to be ready for it. And many Christians are as encumbered, are, as, are encumbered just as badly as a drunk man in a dress on the battlefield by the way that they think about themselves. What is it about their thinking that is such an encumbrance? What's well, that they define themselves? They still define themselves by who they were before they came to Christ. And you see that's Peter's concern here in verse 14. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. This, this is the impediment. This is what's tripping you up. You're still stuck in the past. And he's reminding us of our identity in the present. He has been telling us about our identity in the future because of who we are in Christ. And so he's calling us to leave behind that which is behind us. It makes me think of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 11, where Paul says this to the Christians there. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such, Paul says, and such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were this, but now you are this. And Peter here in this passage is driving home the same point. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. This is the girding up of the loins of your mind. You once lived in ignorance. And that's why you were these things. But now you know who you are in Christ. At least you should. And that affects what you do. Who are you? Who are you? Are you, are these, you the same person that you once were? Our knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, of course not. Thank the Lord I'm no longer that person anymore. But when we say that, but if we watch ourselves closely, the way in which we respond to things that go on around us oftentimes shows a different story, doesn't it? It shows that we've still, we're still holding on. We're still holding on to the past. We still, we look in the mirror and we see that person we once were. And it shows we forget. That we've got amnesia. What Christ has done for us. And so here Peter, he's, he's reminding us. Remember. Who are you? You are a child of God. Verse 14. As obedient children. 1 John 3 1 says, Behold what manner of love. The Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons. And of course, he means by that the sons and the daughters of God. Behold, if you, if you want to see what love looks like, here it is. God has declared you to be his child. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, wrote one of those passages that I think everybody ought to know. From the first time I read it, it's always been in the back of my mind. And I actually, I printed it out in your bulletin. If you want to look in your bulletin, this is so good. He writes... Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. How much do you make of the thought of being God's child? How much does that shape your thinking? How much does it control your worship and your prayers? And what does that say about how well you understand Christianity? It's so unfortunate that so many people who sit in the pews Sunday after Sunday after Sunday do not understand the very faith they claim to believe very well. Who are you? The great Puritan minister and theologian John Owen said that our adoption as children of God is our great and fountain privilege, meaning that every other privilege we have from God flows out of the fact that we are children of God. And you just think about 
what are the privileges that come from that? And we could sit here and make a huge list. But just one of the things I'd like to point out to you is what we are told will happen in Revelation 2.17. Jesus says to the churches that what he will do for those who overcome, who those who are conquerors, which is every true follower of Christ after all, he says, I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone. When you come to faith in Christ, you have been given a new name. When someone is adopted, they receive new names. They take on the name of the family which has adopted them. They leave behind the past. They are no longer known by what they were once or the name of the family they were once part of. And unfortunately, there are many in the church who are still encumbered by holding on to their old names. Like the ones listed by Paul. Sexually immoral. Idolater. Adulterer. Homosexual. Thief. Greedy. Drunkard, reveler, swindler. These are the names of your former family. You're in a new family now, and your name now is child of God. And yet still, some call themselves unlovable. When the word says, no, you are the beloved. Some of you call yourselves failure. When the word says, no, your name is more than conqueror. And so Peter says, get that old thinking out of your way. It's tripping you up. Begin to think soberly. Think rightly about yourself. Your name is child of God. And as a child of God, you are, verses 15 and 16, holy. Now, I know it says there, be holy since God is holy. But look up to 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 2. Look up at the top. We talked about this the first sermon or the second sermon in this series. I'll read from verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. That phrase there, in the sanctification of the Spirit of the spirit to be sanctified is to be set apart in other words it is to be made holy so peter's message is by virtue of your election you are now holy you are holy by the work of the holy spirit now there's a biblical scholar I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his last name, Octomeyer, something like that. He explains what Peter's saying here. He says, he writes, Holiness is therefore not something one can achieve by moral effort. Rather, it is a separation from former culture for God that entails certain behavior appropriate for the situation. The point is not that the readers are to make themselves holy. God accomplished that when they were chosen. Rather, the point is that they must now conform their behavior to their new status. So Peter is saying, you are holy. Now live like it. Now I know referring to yourself as holy will make some of us a little squeamish. It feels a little presumptuous, maybe makes us feel a little uncomfortable because we know ourselves too well. We look in the mirror and we say, I sure don't feel holy looking at that character. But we have to ask ourselves, do we trust the word of God or do you trust your own estimate of yourself? The only safe choice is you trust the word of God. What does it say? What does God say? And that's Peter's whole point, right? I, mean, I love pointing this out to new believers. Because oftentimes, you know, they've had some 
rough stories, and I, I point out, I usually take them to 1 Corinthians. Because 1 Corinthians, if you're familiar with the letter, Paul points out a variety of ways that these Christians were just an absolute mess. And he calls them to account and says, you guys, come on. Given who Christ is and who you've been called to be, how could you possibly continue to live like this? But he begins the letter by saying, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all of those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. And the word saints is a translation of a word in the Greek that literally means holy ones. Those sinners in Corinth, because of their position in Christ, were holy ones. Those sinners in Corinth were indeed saints. And so Paul actually says in chapter 1, verse 30, that they have become sanctification. In other words, they have become holiness. Not because of their own abilities. Not because they clean themselves up. But it's because of their faith in Christ. They have been united to Christ. They have been declared holy. Because of their standing in Christ. And so although you may not dare call yourself holy. And you may not want to walk around saying, hey, here's my business card. And yeah, notice it says saint. You know. But that is what the word of God says. And we believe the word of God. We typically think of sanctification as a process of spiritual growth. And so it is. You know, and some of us, you know, it seems like it takes a little bit while, longer to take off. Some of us is like, pew, pew. whatever it is, the Lord is working in us in his timing. According to his purposes, he's working out our salvation in us. But sanctification is also that moment we place our faith in Christ. We are sanctified. We are being sanctified. One day, we will be fully sanctified as we stand before the Lord. Hebrews 10.10 says, you have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So who are you? You're a child of God who is holy. And you are a child of God who is holy, who is of immense value to the Lord. Do you believe that? Some people struggle with, as much with the other ones as with this. So Jesus told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Now hear, hear the language here. He lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Now hear what Jesus says. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy, more joy, more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, 
There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Who's before the angels of God? God, right? God is before the angels of God. There's more joy before the angels of God. God rejoices. God is a God of joy over you when you come to faith in Christ. Because you were that lost coin. You were that lost sheep. You were that prodigal son that he came running up to to meet and to throw a feast and to put rings on your finger and a robe upon your shoulders. Do you believe it? Word says it. You say you believe the Bible. So Peter says, get that old thinking out of your head and trust what the word says. And I know some of us, we get, again, we get squeamish about this stuff because it feels like we're getting uncomfortably close to that whole movement within the Christian church that focuses on making people feel good about themselves. Stroking their egos rather than focusing upon the glory of God and what he's done for us sinners through Christ. And I, I mean, I totally get that concern. But is it better to err on one side rather than the other? Is it better to not err at all? Wouldn't that be what we'd want to not do is just not err. I want to fall off one side in my attempt to avoid the other side. Let me stay in the middle and, and, and believe what the Bible says. So we don't put people on pedestals. But we read Luke 15 and we say, amen, that's me. I listen to Peter and I say, I'm holy. I'm a child of God. I've been redeemed. And he loves me. And he rejoiced over me. What? I can't wrap my brain around it, but that's what it says. We shouldn't be afraid to call one another saints in Christ. And that is what it is, verse 13, to prepare your minds for action and being sober minded. You think in these terms. These thoughts can, uh, control your thinking. These thoughts control your worship. These thoughts control the way you live your lives. And that is what enables you to set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what leads you to verse 21. Believers in God. Believers in God in all that he says. Believers in God who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And so out of this type of thinking, what do we do? Well, we're obedient. Verse 14, we pursue holiness. Verse 16, we do this in fear. Verse 17, and I know the first two kind of make sense. I mean, they do make sense. They don't kind of make sense. They make sense. But that last one, um, in fear, I mean, it doesn't seem to follow. You know, what, what, do, what do we do with that? Well, it brings to mind another passage that says exactly the same thing. Philippians 2.12. There Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And this is one of those verses that causes people to scratch their heads on the one side and other people say, well, it's pretty clear right there. You can lose your salvation. Isn't that what Paul's saying? You work it out in fear. And what do we fear? Well, we fear the judgment and wrath of God. So therefore, that must be what Paul's talking about. Well, we know that that can't be what Paul's talking about. Because what Paul is saying and what Peter is saying are both what the Holy Spirit is saying. And the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself. 
And it makes no sense to be a holy child of God, beloved by him, with a hope set on heaven, because we have been prophesied to that that is indeed the case. And therefore, we stand firmly in the hope that we will gain an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled. And yet we fear God's casting us away. It doesn't make a lick of sense. And so we know that's not what he's saying. So what's he saying? Well, the phrase of Paul is to work out your own salvation. Really, it's what Peter's been talking about here. Work out your own salvation is that you, your life ought to reflect who you are. I am saved, and so I'm working that out in my life. That's what you see. You see the implications that in my life. Live in a way befitting someone who is saved. So when I happen upon a situation that seems to threaten my future from a human vantage point, I say, well, no, I'm going to work out my salvation here. I'm going to trust exactly what God said. I know that God will not turn his back on me, so I'm going to work it out. I'm going to work this out, trusting in him. But you do this in fear and trembling. You say, well, how does that follow? That seems to be a utter disconnect. Um, but here, 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 this, this is, this is John Gill. Um, John Gill, if you're not familiar with his name, he was the pastor of the church that Spurgeon pastored before Spurgeon. He was the pastor before him. He writes this, he said, this fear and trembling spoken of is such as in, as is consistent with the highest acts of faith, trust and confidence and joy. And as opposed to pride of vain glory, it intends modesty and humility, which is what the apostle is pressing for throughout the whole context of this passage. Here he urges a cheerful and constant obedience to Christ with all humility of soul, without dependence on ourselves or vain glorying in it but ascribing it wholly to the grace of God. So he said, you know what Paul is really arguing for here when he talks about fear, what he's talking about is humility. It is the killing of one's pride. It is motivated by the recognition that God is the holy God who if he were to walk into this room right now, I'd fall down on my face before him. And that our holiness comes from him, not from ourselves. I'm holy simply because he has chosen to call me holy. And so I seek obedience, I pursue a holy life, and I do so in humility, knowing that this all comes from grace. And that's exactly what Peter is driving at there again in verse 21. Our faith and hope are in God. Now the reason I bring in Philippians 2, and here's where we close, is because Paul adds an application here to this that I think Peter would agree with. Paul has written, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Then he adds in verse 15, That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So all that we've discussed here so far has been, how, how is this good for us? How is it good for our own way of thinking? How is it good for the way in which we navigate through the suffering and trials and persecution that we'll face in our world? But is all of this just for us? And Paul says, no, 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 it's not just for you. We are exiles in a fallen world. And our obedience is intended to shine as a light out into the darkness. Pastor Eric Raymond had an observation. I, I thought already he was talking about something else, but it fit just first Peter so well. He writes this. Well, he's talking about um, Philippians passage. He says, I think he is pointing Paul. I think Paul is pointing to the lights in the sky or to stars. What did stars do in the ancient world? They did not have a GPS or Google maps to get around. So they had to use the stars. Mariners would find their way home from the stars. So too the Christian is to shine as a light. Our lives of obedience are to reflect the way home. 
As we demonstrate and declare the gospel, we are to show the way home to the new city prepared by God. Our obedience, that is our growth in the grace of Christ, is to shine. Perhaps the quote by Luther is appropriate. God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. So who are you? You coming to grips with the answer to that question is perhaps more important than you think. It's not just about you. It's about those who are watching you. Let us live who we are. God, give us grace to do so. Let's pray.